Thank you for joining me on another episode of What Saith the Crooked Nose. Today, I'm opening up the vault and pulling out an interview that I had with Philip Permit, perhaps Britain's most renowned crystal healer. He was a part of the Cancel Chronic Pain Digital Summit that I threw that and hosted where I had 19 different experts from around the world to talk about spiritual healing, even had neuroscientists and endocannabinoid experts there. And Philip shares with us his own story, his own introduction to how he could actually communicate with crystals, use them to heal, and how it transformed his life. Tune in, check it out, comment, let me know what you like, go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to the channel so you can make sure that you are always part of the conversation. Enjoy. Philip Permit, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Uh, when you and I first spoke, I felt like uh, there was a, a, a fun connection there. And uh, allow me to really introduce you. Um, you know, Philip is described by the Daily Mail, which is the highest paid circulation newspaper in the UK, as Britain's leading crystal expert, author of the internationally acclaimed bestseller, uh, The Crystal Healer. He's a crystal master teacher and healer, chronic pain expert from his own experience, meditation teacher and Reiki master. His latest book, Crystal Connections, has recently been published. Philip has an honors degree in applied biology from London University and has lectured on crystal healing and pain relief at the University of Hertfordshire. Philip, how the heck are you? I'm great. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to, to meet you online. Yes. Yeah. Well, l lovely to meet you as well. And I, I can't, I can't help, but um, at least for me in the way that I think, you know, notice that with crystals that resonate at different frequencies, right. And you have these magnificent guitars behind you that also resonate at different frequencies. Is there, is that uh, not an accident? Uh, no, it's not. I do a lot of stuff with crystal singing bowls as well. And um, I've actually produced an album, which is called Walking the Walk. Um, and that's a mixture of uh, crystal singing bowls, Native American drums and a lot of blues guitar. And one of the blues guitars which is actually featured on it specifically is a guitar by Joe Nags, who's an American luthier. Um, and it actually has Chrysocola crystals inlaid into the wood in the guitar. And it just changes the, the frequency, changes the sound of the guitar. And it's incredible. That is amazing. And so with it changing the frequency, have you noticed uh, a difference in the way in which the audience kind of consumes the music? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's very much they, um, they get more absorbed by it. So it, it's sort of... Um, it's an experience they become one with. I mean, on the album, um, no one buys CDs anymore, but if you did buy a CD, then, then the notes on the album actually say, you know, create the atmosphere for you to, to listen to it. You know, turn the lights down, light a candle, you know, get yourself into a really comfortable space. Um, and it, it just takes you to another place in another dimension. Mm, that's awesome. And, you know, somebody doesn't just come to become, you know, Britain's leading crystal expert, you know, by by tripping into that, right? W what is it about crystals that really resonates with you and that really dr dr draws you to them? They talk to me. Quite literally, they talk to me. So I first got into all alternative therapies, actually, because um, I used to suffer from Crohn's disease, mm. um, which is basically, for those who don't know it, um, the, the bowel basically... Um, basically uh, swells but it swells in and it blocks itself and so there are various medical treatments and interventions for it and at an extreme they do a resection of the bowel which is basically they cut a bit out and stick the other bits together with sellotape or glue or whatever they have handy at the time and um, I'd had a couple of these and then I had a, a third bowel resection and it went a little bit wrong and or actually the bowel reception went perfectly it's just other things went wrong mm. and one of the things that happened was they severed the sciatic nerve going to my right leg and um as many people will know nerve tissue never regrows so when i came around from the anesthetic the consultant said to me oh the operation was a great success sorry you can't walk 
and that was basically it um because there was some medical reason why it was severed so it wasn't a, you know an accidental damage can't be sued that sort of thing um just can't walk and that was the moment literally the moment that i got into alternative therapies because up till then they'd been really really interesting but i hadn't really needed them mm. um but they, they were just but at this point in time the medical world was saying go home lie down you know maybe get a wheelchair or something if you want to get around but that's it you you know you're out of the game and i just completely immersed in in alternative therapies and over the next couple of weeks to start off with in hospital my my then wife she brought in lots of um different therapists and all of this was really really new i mean i'm talking 30 years ago most of it was was new in uh, the uk i think there was two percent of the population at the time claimed to use any type of alternative therapy and that included vitamin supplements and herbs and, and things like that so it's almost nothing and unheard of and um, we had reiki people come in and shaman witch doctors crystal healers all sorts, everything and, and anything things that you've heard of things you haven't heard of things i wish i hadn't heard of um <laughs> you know the most revolting smelling herbs that you can imagine you brew them up and they just stink the whole place out but they're apparently good for you and i'm sure every single thing worked and helped the process but anyway after a couple of weeks in those days I, I smoked and i was pretty sort of desperate for a cigarette and a cousin of mine brought in some cigarettes and in those days as well remember going back 30 years you were allowed to smoke inside hospitals um some of the younger people sort of who are watching this might be totally <gasps> shocked you smoke in a hospital <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You could, right? Or, you know, half the population smoked. This, this wasn't unusual. Right. Um, but you weren't allowed to smoke in the, hotel, in the, the hospital room because uh, of the oxygen. So it might just blow up. So you, there was a designated smoking area. And this was in a corridor with big windows, which was down the, the, um, down the corridor from my room. And I had um, a drip on one side of me, which was going to my arm. And it was on like a, a wheelie stand thing mm -hmm. and on the other side of me there was this massive box that was pumping pre-digested food into my heart i always wondered who actually digested the food but we won't go there that's too um anyway and that was also on a wheelie thing and apparently i got these two wheelie things and i got myself out into the corridor and i'm sort of supporting myself with these things and i'm in the corridor and i'm smoking a cigarette and a nurse comes along and the nurse says what are you doing here and i thought okay this is going to be the whole smoking lecture she said you can't walk get back to bed i thought ah okay so what am i what have i been doing and so then when i finish the cigarette i go back to the room and there's a crystal a quartz crystal not dissimilar not dissimilar to this one and he's sitting next to the, the bed and he looked at me and he said so now you understand and that was the first time a crystal actually spoke to me and so from that moment my interest really got hung up with crystals uh, also, that just gave me the chills man I, I felt that i felt the truth of that that's fantastic right. so all the energy healing works i know it works i do it myself you know i've had energy healing all of it works but my background was actually as a scientist because you know in a different lifetime i, I did a degree in applied biology Mm -hmm. and um as a scientist you want something physical this, this sort of you put your hands up and stuff happens well that's great but what do you do with this whereas a, a crystal you can actually take it and you can do various things with it and i spent a year convalescing and literally just playing with crystals so by the way i walked out the hospital six weeks and two days after i was told i'd never walk again and what, what about your leg like did the feeling come back yeah uh yes so when i get really really tired now most of the time it, it's normal i'll put that in big inverted commas my normal um but uh when i get really tired i have to think about moving my right leg okay um and i think a, a few um neurology specialists have said to me that what has probably happened is the sciatic nerve hasn't regrown but other nerves are carrying the nerve signal to my leg 
and they say this can happen occasionally usually it takes years and years and years to happen and for it to happen in six weeks and two days is unheard of mm -hmm. um, but it, it links in absolutely with how I feel crystals work because I believe that crystals basically work by speeding up what our bodies can do so anything our body can do if you've got the right crystal it will heal quicker and so, so I, I i firmly believe that everything has a spirit right in fact pre, yeah. you know pre-socratic philosophers talked about this as well hmm. and um it, it, is it that the crystal was maybe communing with your with the own your own spirit of of your of your nerve and your nervous system or do you think maybe it was the the crystal was communicating with the crystalline structure of the water inside your body no i, th I actually think that the that all crystals actually speak to us and communicate to us on a spirit or soul level mm. on a energy level and when that happens you change and you shift and in ways that you don't always expect so just having a crystal um because you want to heal your broken arm might have a whole load of other effects it might help your arm heal but it may very well help the cause of why you broke your arm because you were rushing around because you were too stressed because you were whatever else and so they they change how we are mm. that's that's awesome man i i love that so much and what was it that took you from being a, a you know really immersed in science to then getting into you know this you know, this alternative therapy I'm still totally immersed in science. You know, the, the, to me, it's the same thing. Um, I like the thought of complementary therapy rather than alternative therapy. Because I, I think that. there are some things medicine, modern medicine does, which uh, alternative therapy has a real challenge with. Things like um, emergency, trauma, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, go to the ER room, go to the doctor. Yeah, you get yep. shot by you get shot by somebody, you get stabbed by somebody. Yeah, go into yeah. the ER, stop yeah. the bleeding, make sure that your life is yep. Yeah, yep, sew sure. it back together. Um, yep. After after that, the long term treatment of, of people and especially stress, and so much is stress related, whether it's skin conditions or gut conditions or, or any mental conditions, mental health, whatever it is. Uh, so much of it is, is stress related, and it all revolves around our brilliance. At, being the best animals on the planet with a fight and flight response. Mm. So basically the fight and flight response is not designed for us to live in cities. Oh, it's, well, designed, I mean, yeah, it, it's just designed for us to live in small bands of, of people where you know everyone. So if someone is different within that group, if someone has a mental issue or physical issue or whatever, they're never regarded as a threat because they have their place within that group, within your group. And the only threats that you can ever have is from something external coming in, whether it's another animal or, or whatever else. So we're designed to, to basically be gathering our, our berries and our fruits and whatever. And if a saber toothed tiger jumps out in front of you, you then produce this amazing response where you produce 200 different drugs inside your body instantly in two seconds. And you turn from being a loving, kind warm human being into yeah. the most violent vicious animal on the planet so much so that you can actually win against a saber-toothed tiger which has these massive claws and massive teeth and massive head and bigger than you and or you can run away from it and survive but either way you survive mm -hmm. and then what's supposed to happen after that is that you get a relaxation response and when you get the relaxation response, it's not instant. It takes about 15 minutes. And you just sit and do nothing when you're safe. And your body produces another 198 different drugs. And these are real drugs. You know, pharmaceutical companies use these yeah. the whole time to, to change how we feel. They produce them. But your body produces them in any case. And those 198 drugs counteract most of the drugs that you produce for the fight and flight response and the other two drugs that you produce they just dissipate in the body in any case so they've gone and after about 15 minutes you go back to being a loving kind warm human being 
The problem is when that gets interrupted, then you get stressed. And that's what creates stress. And we don't have an appropriate response to lots of things that happen in life. So, for example, if your boss tells you off and says something you don't like, you actually only have two responses. You can punch them on the nose or you can run away. <laughs> and neither are great career moves. Right. Right. Yeah. And if you do neither, you become stressed because your body has just produced instantly produced. You know, how can you say that to me? There's those 200 drugs. Yeah. That's saying, I'm going to kill this man, this woman, this person, whatever. And you don't because it's just not appropriate. Well, and what's so interesting about what you're talking about, too, is, you know, with the stress response, you know, Einstein has, has said that the, the mark of intelligence is actually based upon imagination. And what's interesting about that idea is that the brain doesn't the brain doesn't know the difference between imagining and reality. And if we imagine yeah. something, we imagine ourselves safe or we imagine ourselves stressful. Well, then we start creating those neural pathways. We start living in a place where instead of like you were saying, uh, having this you know, this uh, concoction of drugs to, to get us to safety. Well, now they're just constantly flooding our system and taxing our body. And because totally. there, there's no reprieve. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Uh, and the, the, as soon as you get that, then you start feeling pain as we should get that onto pain because we're talking about it. But you yeah. start feeling pain everywhere and you get chronic conditions, which in a way, you're, whether they've been created by a physical thing or an emotional thing or a mental issue or just an imaginary one, that pain is real that people suffer. Yeah. And it's those pathways in the brain that create them that say, OK, so now you're feeling pain. And so you feel pain. And the more pain you feel, the more your brain says you're in pain and it reinforces that pathway. So Rumi, uh, you know, an ancient mystic had said that the cure for the pain is in the pain. And, you know, I, I you know, mix that with the idea of a modern philosopher by the name of uh, Ken Wilber, you know, who, you know, has this idea of centaur awareness, right? A centaur being a mythical beast that was part, you know, anim uh, part horse and then part human. Uh, and he talks about this idea of, you know, if a, if a centaur wants to run faster, does, you know, d does it get, you know, boots with spurs and jam them into its hips to run faster? Does it whip itself to run faster? Or does it just will itself to run faster? And so often it seems that people who, who live in a stressful environment view themselves as a brain that happens to be schlepping around this body. And the body is just meant to be the slave to the brain rather than the body be the external representation of the brain because they're one and the same. And um, the pain there, the idea of the, the cure for the pain is in the pain, is, is the idea that the body is then communicating in the only way that it knows how that says, hey, something's not right here. There's a disturbance in the force and you need to address it. Otherwise, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. And then you get all of those illnesses, diseases that affect the body, which are all stress related. And saying they're stress related, it doesn't mean, say, they're caused by stress, but a lot of them are made a lot worse by stress so some people have physical issues which they've got but as soon as they tie into that and they believe that that is going to hurt it hurts more and more and more yep the power of belief totally and one thing that really really helps with any sort of chronic pain condition is a little crystal i'm just going to show you this guy here um yeah, uh, just trying to get that. There we go. Um, so this is banded amethyst or chevron amethyst, it's known as. And um, so I'm just trying to get it to fit in the, sure. the camera and sort of doing, actually I'm doing weird things trying to get it into the camera. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and this crystal, it takes the edge off of pain. And that makes such a difference to people suffering with chronic pain. And I know that just from my own experience as well. And there was a test which was done with these with one of the London teaching hospitals. Um, only very, very small. It was only with 20 people. But 18 people actually out of the 20 said that they had less pain just by carrying this with them, just by holding it for 10 or 15 minutes a day, which is incredible. It is incredible. That's fantastic. And so did your... So, or rather, it seems like your affinity with crystals was accidental, but when you, you know, happened upon it right there in that hospital room, it then it became a 
a, a purposeful drive yeah totally yeah i mean i i totally accidental it could have been anything that that i had i could have gone into herbs or, or reiki or uh, uh, qigong or all of these things I, I now do and work with but um none of them were actually the thing that caught my imagination at the time and it was just that one moment with one crystal and also just having the science background having something physical that you can touch and hold and you can research and you can look up and, and do things because our entire 21st century lifestyle i mean the only reason why we're having this on zoom together is because of crystal technology and yeah. no crystals no 21st century lifestyle you know no washing machines tumble dryers dishwashers microwaves no ovens no you know unless you're digging a hole in the ground and sort of making it with a fire pit but even yeah. then you have because you need the pyrite or the chert to actually make the spark to light your fire so that's still crystal technology and um even back to the earliest sort of pre-human ancestors when we came down from the trees there's a site in uh, south africa called marisburg which um, has the oldest human remains they're about three, three and a half million years old. And they're sort of pre-human. Pre uh, but when they dig down to the deepest levels there, they still find crystal tools. They find chert, flint, if you like, is the common term for it. They find pyrite, which they use to start fires with. The first wheel that we, we had was created from stone tools. We used, uh, you know, arrowheads made of obsidian or made of, anything that would give a, a, a sharp edge flint whatever and knives and all of that has taken us on step by step by step right the way through to rocket science and when someone says oh this crystal stuff it's not rocket science no it is rocket science <laughs> <laughs> I love that. um well and so i gotta ask you know where did that crystal come from in the first place in your hospital room that was actually brought in by a crystal healer who came in to do a treatment on me. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And, you know, um, you know, I know that in my own, you know, practice when, you know, I'm taking somebody through and helping them on, you know, spiritual realms that there's a lot of intuition that guides me. And it was, I'm, I'm curious, did you talk to that, uh, that healer afterwards? And did they mention that, you know, maybe that crystal just felt right based upon your needs. And then it started communicating with you, which is like, okay, well, it, cheerio, sure seems like it. <laughs> that's uh, correct. I, I think their approach to it was much more shamanic than mine. I mean, I've done a lot of shamanic training myself, mm -hmm. but um, I, I sort of bring in bits of it when I need to in my practice. But um, I tend to rely on the crystals much more than the spirit of the crystals, more mm. than any shamanic training if you like yeah. so i'm much more open-minded and i let them go where they want to go and how they want to work and i think that the healer that was working with me with crystals was was they were very good in what they did but they were very limited in the crystals they worked with yeah so it was quartz crystal and quartz crystal and that was it what I love about what you just said is that you you effectively allow the spirit of the crystal to to live and harness right the, the path that is be, is best for it. And you know what I like about that is that you know spirit doesn't really it doesn't do well with with arbitrary rules, right? When no. we set, yeah, when we set up rules for the sake of rules, the spirit rebels. And um, I I love that you that you give it the ability to to do what it wants and how it wants and in its own in its own nature. And um, you know, are there any you know chronic pain conditions or you know uh, states of dis ease that people have come to you with that kind of blew you away at how powerful the crystals were at helping? There, you know, there was one last night. Um, I did because I did the official launch of my book. I, I, I'm sure I can mention it. You don't mind? It's probably reversed, isn't it? In that picture? Absolutely. But, yeah. Nope, it's That's not it. reversed. It looks good. Crystal connections. I'm sure it'll be on on the, the website uh, and on the forum. Um, but um, there was a lady there who was in a wheelchair and um, after I finished giving the, the, I did a talk and workshop and, and afterwards she said about her pain and she said how she felt better just from being there and some of the exercises that we did, although they weren't specifically focused on pain. And so I just asked her where the pain was 
And she said, well, it was her spine and it was the top of her neck and the middle of her back. And oh, and it was her lower back and it was her hips and her knees and her thighs were really in pain the whole time. And her head hurt and, and it went on and on and on. And she described almost literally every single part of her body. Yeah. And I just said to her, where's the worst point of pain? And I didn't quite know what was happening. And all I had in my hand was a very small, about this big, actually, quartz crystal. So very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, literally, it was where was the worst point of pain. And she pointed to the, the bottom of her back. And I just took the quartz crystal and the point of it and just moved the, it in a circle about an inch or so away from her back. And after literally about 60 seconds, about one minute, she said she could feel that and she could feel a warmth. And within another minute, it was radiating to every bit of her body that she said hurt. That's incredible. And she smiled and her husband was there and he just broke down in tears. Oh, she wow. Because I don't think that he'd actually seen her genuinely smile without a joke being told, basically, for years. Yeah, um, can really rob can can really rob the soul and just yeah. rob the quality of life. Uh, and I'm not saying that that is going to help her stand up and run around out of her wheelchair. But even if it gives that moment of relief, it's wonderful. But I actually think it changed her life because it showed her that there's a possibility she doesn't have to be in pain every minute. Mm, man, that's incredible. And no, is there is there something that you feel that when that first crystal in that hospital room you know spoke to you, is there was there like destiny revealed almost at that point? And you may not have realized that you were walking it. You may have looked backwards and then realized, holy cow, look what I'm doing now. Was there uh, some sort of yes. path that unfailed? It, it was as if a light went off. It just literally a light went off and it said, um, "You've got to do this." doesn't matter you don't know what you're doing it doesn't know what it what it is and when i started there, there were no crystal healers i mean literally there were in the uk there were six people who claimed to be crystal healers i, mm -hmm. I was the same um no one knew anything there was um vaguely a couple of american books um there's uh, the crystal healer melody who you may have heard of um she's passed away recently but mm -hmm. um she ended up a really, really good friend of mine, and um, she w helped a lot. But other than, you know, a few people in America, a few people over here, there were odd people dotted around the world doing things, but nothing was connected. And slowly over time, people started doing things. And as people, we started sort of communicating with each other. We found, although we might do things very differently, actually we thought very similarly mm. we might have different words for things maybe someone would call it a spirit someone else would call it a soul someone else would call it an angel someone else would call it a guide so whatever yeah but the the, the dialogue was the same and mm. then you just got two choices basically one's the prescriptive side which um there are loads of good books. I've written some of the good books, you know, but um, there are loads of good books about crystals and which crystal does what and which crystal to work with for, for what condition. And that's a great place to start. But it's also limiting because crystals do so much more. And that's totally what I'm into now. And the book that I've just written, which is Crystal Connections, and that's the one I wanted to write originally. And my publishers said, no, this is two way out. No one's going to go for this. And after you've sold half a million books, then your publisher will publish what you want to write. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I love that. And yeah. so when when that light bulb went off and mm. the, the crystals are now kind of revealing a, a, a path for you, um, you know, was there something that perhaps you were missing in your life that this was like a... a, a, a a lodestone, a missing piece for it that just kind of fit? Yeah, I think what was happening then, I mean, at that time in my life, I was actually promoting rock and roll. So rock and roll bands. 
Um, and this was in the 1980, uh, this was 1990s, early 1990s. And I was producing a lot of the 1970s acts as revivals, basically, mm. which had all just yeah. started. And also some of the 50s greats like Carl Perkins and stuff I was promoting and all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, it was very, very stressful continuously stressful it was 24 hours a day non-stop absolutely amazing but totally exhausting yeah and because of that there was a an essence looking back on it very much looking back at it and not sort of feeling it at the time but there was a big hole missing um which was to do with spirituality so it's absolutely great great fun um you know all of the, the rock and roll cliches that you like but uh missing something and that something was a, a soul or a spirit to it basically mm. well and, and then the, uh, in the mortal words of uh jeff goldblum right from jurassic park right mm -hmm. life finds a way right life yeah. found a way for you to be able to you know compensate and be able to walk again when you were told that you weren't Right. Yeah. And then life found a way to be able to help you deal with your own stress and find a purpose to help others, right? Help others with their chronic condition, whether it be in the mind or in the body. And that's phenomenal, man. I, I deeply applaud you for having the, uh, the, the bravery to be like, you know what? Hey, there's very few people and I'm going to be a pioneer. I'm going to be a trailblazer. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, um, I've, I've never actually cared what anyone thinks about what I do, which is a really good place to be. It is a good <laughs> a great place to be. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you care about what other people think about what you're doing, you get really limited because you can't do this or you can't do that because it doesn't fit in with this belief or that belief or or whatever it is or what your parents say or whatever. Um, it's just being open to possibilities. And that's the way that I work the whole time. And uh, I mean, people, can, my clients come to me and they say, oh, what are you going to do with me this week? And I say, I haven't got a clue. And I genuinely haven't got a clue. It's, you know, lie down, I'm going to put some crystals on you. That I know. And I don't know what. Um, and they can tell me all sorts of things, you know, that's going on in their life or whatever injury they've had or whatever, and can I help that? Yeah, sure, I know I can help it. But I don't know how until you actually lie down and the crystals yes. tell me which ones actually want to help you. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a very, years and years ago, a very well-known... Um, tennis player in the UK who became very famous and sort of did quite well at Wimbledon, never actually won it, but did quite well. Um, and when he was a kid, um, his parents brought him to me because um, he had injured his arm. I think he, he fractured his arm. And it was months and months before Wimbledon was going to happen and he wanted to play in junior Wimbledon for the first time. And um, he went to the doctors and the doctor said, yeah, no, but it's a simple fracture and fix it. And they, they fixed it and, and it wouldn't heal and it wouldn't heal and it wouldn't heal. And whatever they did, it wouldn't heal. And eventually his parents brought, brought him to me. And um, we did a bit of work and it started to heal and it healed and it got better. And he played at Wimbledon for the first time and lost in the first round. But that wasn't my fault. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hey you got him there man good for you yeah and, and the, the the thing was that he was so scared about not being able to go to Wimbledon that he was preventing his own arm from healing mm. his own fear of not being able to do it mm. created this mental sort of cycle that stopped his arm from healing well, and it, it, because it creates blocks, right? It creates blocks yeah. in our energy. And, you know, uh, everything is energy. This is something that physics proves. And yeah. if we create blocks in our energy, well, you know, there's, there's a spirit of our arm. There's a spirit of our brain. There's a spirit yeah. of our heart. There's a spirit of all of our major organs. And, yeah. uh, you know, I uh, also was working with a, a, a chronically ill uh, person last night who, you know, came to me in, in tears, who, you know, bone spurs on, on their um, vertebrae, uh, bad liver, you know, bad heart. And now, you know, MRIs now uh, proven that the bone spurs are gone. Um, and it's amazing to be able to, to take somebody through that. And, you know, especially when they have an ounce of belief and you help them build that into a pound of belief, and then you help them carry that on. 
right? That way they, they don't need me for the rest of their life, right? I'm there just like any coach there to help them get to a place where they can support their own, their, their own weight. And, um, and then learn how to prevent, right? Those blocks in the first place by, right? Our thoughts, by our imagination, by if we're going to imagine, you know, um, an extreme scenario, well, let's make it extremely amazing instead of extremely bad. Yeah, totally. Uh, I like the idea as well that um, we're beings of light. We're made of mm -hmm. light. Yeah. And almost every religion, every tradition around the world says something like we're beings of light or we come from the light or we go back to the light or something to do with light. And that's one of the most amazing things when you start to work with crystals that it is all about light. And I don't know if I can, I might be able to show you this on, on the camera. But um, the camera's the wrong way around as well, of course. But uh, if I just move my hand, this crystal around like this, I think you can just about see that there is some light on the palm of my hand there. Can you see that? It's hard to tell because of the camera. But yeah. I feel like I feel like I can see a little bit more light. Just there. Yeah. Yeah, there's some light. And so what happens, and I mean you can do this, anyone can do this at home with a quartz crystal, is quartz will channel the light in the room. So it just takes the light that's in the room and it focuses it basically. And it can focus it onto the palm of your hand. It's it's much easier to see it yourself here rather than mm. sort of trying to demonstrate it like that. But if the one thing that quartz crystals do is it focuses light and it puts a bit more light where it's needed, mm. then if we are beings of light and made of light, then surely it would help us repair whatever it is, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is. And the truth of the matter is that we are actually beings of light because we are physically made of light. Everything in the world everything. is made of light. Yeah. Everything is. Everything is made of photons of light. Yeah. You know, you are, your hat is, your glasses are, yep. your chair is, everything. And so just changing how that light um, is by focusing a bit more of it changes things. Well, and even sounds, right? You got photons for light, you got phonons for sounds. And so yeah. the sounds are also related to light and everything is light. Everything, yes. So it's really an incredible thing that it's a very easy thing to do to make people better. And it doesn't matter if they believe or not. You know, whenever I do a, a, a general sort of talk or presentation, public one rather than sort of a, a, a workshop, and I'm going to demonstrate something, I will always pick the biggest skeptic in the audience to demonstrate with. Because if you've got, you know, someone who's totally into crystal healing, they're expecting light and stars and explosions and wow. And this is <laughs> if you've got, got a skeptic and you yeah. get the tiniest feeling, it's wow, something happened. Yeah. And, and they're the easiest people to work with. Yeah. Mm. Be well, because, I mean, it's evidence-based. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. And I think one of the hardest things is um, the whole evidence-based thing, because people say, you know, oh, there's no evidence for, you know, crystal healing working. Um, there's a lot. It's just it's not double-blind test. But then you can also take the argument that actually there's a medical procedure which is done every day, thousands, tens of thousands of times all over the world even kill some people and it has never been scientifically tested or proven that it works and that's called surgery mm. no one has ever done a double blind test on surgery you know you'd have to take someone who's perfectly healthy cut the bit of them out to see if it how it affects them and how it affects the person who's ill mm. that's it well you know what that makes me uh, think of is there was a, a mice uh, a mouse study where they put these mice in a jar of water where they couldn't actually get out. So the, this tube, and so they drop them in, so there's no way for them to climb out and they're just swimming and they're swimming and they're swimming. And it was, it was built around um, uh, the influences of, of lactobacillus, I wanna say rhamnosus, 
Uh, and so they gave the control group uh, just uh, broth and they gave the test group broth with this lactobacillus. And what happens is, uh, you know, they have these mice in there. And after about five minutes, you know, the control group, every single time after right about five minutes, you know, the, the mouse just gives up on life and just does the dead mouse float. And then they go in and they pull it out. They take a blood sample and basically they've got the the chemical recreation of, ah, right, uh, in their blood. But the ones that got the lactobacillus rhamnosus, what they did is um, after five minutes, still swimming. After six minutes, still swimming. After seven minutes, still swimming. Well, that's really interesting. And so what they did is they went and they uh, uh, took the blood uh, uh, test and they found that there was the introduction of what was called GABA. And GABA is a neurotransmitter that actually helps us deal with stress. And so effectively when the body is going, ah, the GABA is like, shh, 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 ah, shh, shh, shh. And um, so what they found out was this was actually traveling up the vagus nerve from the gut up to the brain. And how they found that out is they clipped the vagus nerve of the test group and they did the death, dead mouse float after five minutes as well, no matter, no matter what. And, um, you know, not just, and it's not just surgery, right? Cancer doesn't cure, or sorry, uh, chemotherapy doesn't cure cancer. Chemotherapy right. just makes it an infertile ground for literally anything that yes. grow the theory is it kills the cancerous cells before it kills you. Yeah. Well, but it, yeah, yeah. It kills the yeah. cancer, but it may also kill you too. Yeah. 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 You just and, hope uh, it kills the cancer before it kills you. Yeah. yeah. And well, and you know, these things that cost, you know, I mean, chemotherapy, I think is like, it's like a half a million dollars. It's, it's insane. It's insane. The amount of stuff that we put people through and then bone marrow transplants when, you know, um, you know, they say that there's no, um, you know, th there's no evidence for it. Well, what I find is that most people, when they say there's no evidence, it's because they're waiting for people to tell them and say, well, here, here, here's the evidence right here and hit them over the head with it. Because that's really the way that we've been indoctrinated, uh, you know, in, in medicine. You know, I've worked in the medical field, whether it be from, you know, a combat medic in the, in the U.S. Army, you know, working in, uh, you know, pediatric medical research as a, uh, re you know, clinical research coordinator. Um, and, you know, we find that we are so absolutist in our trust and faith, absolutely faith in, in science, that often what happens is that we fold our arms just like a little toddler. And when somebody tells us something that seems to go against what we've been indoctrinated at as in just like a toddler who doesn't want to eat their vegetables, no, I don't like it. And then it's like, well, how do you know? You haven't even tried it. Well, I just know. And, um, you know, the great mystics of your, you know, the great philosophers of today really talk about how life is about experience. Because how do we know? How, I mean, how do we know if it works for us or not if we haven't actually tried it? Yeah, totally. I agree with you 100%. And it's about being open to possibilities and not closed. Yeah. Well, because um, skeptical and closed minded is dogmatic. Yeah. And yet that's where we find most scientific minds. Yes, yeah. In a way, the more specialized someone becomes, the less they know because their field is, gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And they know a lot of, until they know so much about absolutely nothing. Ooh. They know more than anyone else does about nothing. But it, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it is. And then they're unquestioned because they're a consultant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and um, then, um, you know, the, the, to, to that point, Right, they know so much about the spleen, or they know so much about the kidneys, or they know so much about the heart. Well, what about the way they interact with the entire system as a whole? Well, no, we don't care about that. We only care yeah. about the, the the lowest common denominator. So then we can have a pill that says here here's what affects that lowest common denominator. Who cares if it causes system wide you know problems or catastrophe, <laughs> right? Because yeah, who, you know, who cares if we cut your nerve, right? Mm -hmm. It was medically necessary. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's um, a crazy situation where um, people really just learn more and more and more about less and less and less. Mm. And when they do that, as you said, it becomes so specialized that the, the actual body, the being, becomes irrelevant to them. And it doesn't matter to them how someone is. It only matters that they have cured the heart disease or the liver or whatever it was they were looking at and the side effects of, of whatever's happened and the state the person's been left in it, it, it isn't important it stops being the prime thing 
so health becomes a secondary thing to the cure. Mm, I love that. And what do you find, um, you know, uh, how, how do you find the, um, the marriage between science and, you know, spirituality, especially as somebody who, you know, speaks at universities, who comes with a background of science, you know, where is it that you find that, that, that wonderful blend? I just find that when you strip away the dogma from science and you strip away religion from spirituality, because that also create, puts a dogma onto spirituality. Um, and when you strip those away, then they're speaking the same language. Or if you like, they're two foreign languages saying the same thing. That makes sense. That makes a lot of so sense. So the, the, um, the feeling that you get underneath it from maybe the spiritual side has an explanation in the scientific side as long as both are open-minded and not saying my book is better than yours or my study is better than yours. And that's where all human sort of wars and chaos and everything else come from is mine's better than yours. And yeah, none of it's fair. right because we're all actually underneath everything. We're the same. Yeah. Yep. And well, and, and that's the, the idea of, you know, we're all created in the image of God, right? I'm convinced that that is speaking to, you know, the soul, right? Like you said, we're all like fragments of light coming from the source of light. And, yes. you know, and then we are now a projection of that light and everything is energy. And if we were to take out all the empty space and every human on earth, right, we fit into the size of about a sugar cube. And so yeah. you know, this is where digital physics really comes in that we do most likely live in some level of simulation or hologram. And the idea that energy, light, can help fix the light, the problems in the light, in the hologram, well, I mean, that's just, duh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that, that works for me. And also, the, we don't, we haven't got a clue. Humans are just this, this you know, what, how long have we been human beings? 250,000 years, maybe, something like that. Yeah. We're this tiny moment in time, whereas crystals have actually been here for the oldest ones, four billion years. Yeah. You know, zircon crystals have been on the earth four billion years since it started to be solid. And they're living things as well. We have such a narrow view of life. And yet, um, simply, because I know that we're, we're running out of time, I'll be really quick and simple. There are only three things you need to, for life. Uh, as a species you need to be able to eat to grow and reproduce and if you can do those th three things then that species is a living thing and yeah. if you can't it's not and crystals do those three things they eat they eat their environment they grow you know they grow because you, you you get you get little crystals you get big crystals you know yeah. uh, how did the big one get big it's not a miraculous thing you know it's it's science and um, and they reproduce and crystals do reproduce in different ways, which you know we're not going to go into now, but there are two main ways that they do. And they've been on planet Earth for millions, hundreds of millions of years. You know, um, this guy comes from Colombia and I think is about 200 million years old. Wow. Uh, and the human brain can't cope with this with hundreds of millions of years. Before you get into the billions, forget that totally. Our, our minds just go, it's like standing in front of the Grand Canyon and thinking, wow, you know, what is this expanse? And your brain can't cope with it. It just goes, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it does that when you think that something's been alive for hundreds of millions of years. You know, they were knocked over by dinosaurs. Yeah. And we might pick them up and move them from one place to another, but whatever we do with them, they're going to end up back in the earth one day and they're going to go back to growing sooner or later. And it doesn't matter if that's tomorrow morning or if it's in 10 years or 100 years or a million years or 4 billion years, another 4 billion years. Um, but they're going to be here long, 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 long after mankind is. And they will have another species to play with. Yeah, that's... um. I mean, that's so true. I mean, when you, when you get something that has, uh, right, eight zeros at the end of it, right? Like, I mean, how do we even comprehend that? It's so difficult. And yeah, yeah and uh, it's, it, it's, it's, life becomes much more amazing when we quit trying to label everything as the known and allow ourselves to have unknown experiences 
Um, and that's what experience is about, is, is about say, hey, what is this unknown thing? Let's go ahead and figure this out, right? The idea of eating from the tree of life or eating from the tree of you know knowledge of good and evil. I can read a book all day long, but until I apply it, right? You are in implied biology, right? If, I, if I, I can read a, bio, a biology book all day long, I can take the tests just like when I was in the army. You know, when we were you know, practicing out in the field versus taking tests, right? There was one uh, lady I was uh, that uh, was training with us, and she would constantly uh, study when we we're out in the field, expecting to to do our hands-on, you know, practical exams. Uh, she would just be studying for the tests, and she would scrape by and uh, do what she needed to do to pass the uh, practical exams. But she would smash the written exams, and you know, every single instructor you know, there that would say, well, look, guys, we want you to do well on the written test, but you, you're you out of your mind if you think that that's who we want in the field. Mm. Yeah. When you're out in the field, you've got to live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we need somebody who, who's used to that experience and used to being able to, uh, to, to learn from experience and not just learning from a finite amount of knowledge from a book that's teaching you what to think, not how to think. Experience teaches us how to think. And uh, something I shared on, um, you know, another interview was this uh, amazing uh, quote that I that I got from Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is, uh, "Those who know how to think are empowered far beyond those who know only what to think." Totally, completely, yeah. And I think we even have to surrender ourselves to the point of being open to not thinking and just experiencing. Yep. And then thinking about it afterwards not whilst you're experiencing, just experience. Well, and that's a great way to let the stress of depression, PTSD, that sort of chronic pain in, in the mental space to really just slough away and just slough yeah. off. And um, man, this has been such an incredible and enlightening conversation. And I know that you have a free gift for the audience, for those who are um, who, who are watching, and it's a crystal singing bowl uh, for, for meditation. And um, we'll have a link there uh, for people to go and- uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a download of the music, not the actual crystal singing bowl. Oh, sorry. That's what I meant. Yeah. The download for the, the meditation. Correct. And, um, and so that way people can go and, and get that and get that uh, meditation and, you know, you'll have uh, 48 hours. So go and get it now. Make sure that you get it now. And, um, you know, Philip, do you have any last words of wisdom for people who, um, you know, maybe who are suffering, but they've been so used to, you know, living in that, that known space? Right. And then that to maybe help them bridge that gap to make it easier for them to kind of accept the experience. So when I do lectures at universities on alternative pain relief, and um, one of the groups of people that I've worked with are medical professionals. So it includes doctors, paramedics, nurses, radiographers, anyone basically in the medical profession. And I always start that by saying to them that um, essentially there is only um one reaction in the body one biochemical reaction in the body that produces energy and everything's to do with energy and that is adenine triphosphate breaks down to adenine diphosphate atp breaks down to adp there's an enzyme that loops it back and it sort of goes around and it produces energy and it's like a, a battery a pump and that produces that's the only chemical reaction in the body that produces energy or the only significant one. The only problem to that, and every single person in this audience has done this degree, so they know about it, is that it only produces 20% of the energy the human body needs. So whatever you tell me might be 20% true. Mm. Whatever I tell you might be 80% true. Wow. Wow. And for me, that's where that's where the science really comes into it is knowing where the science doesn't work and then being open to, OK, there's something else. What is it? And I don't actually care what people call it or, or how they find it or how they come to it, but just opening the mind to the possibility that there's something else. And when you do that with someone who's suffering from chronic pain, the first thing that happens is, oh, OK, there's a possibility. The next thing I tell them is always about the synapse between nerves. 
because people talk about neurotransmitters and there's a chemical that carries the, the electrical si signal from one nerve to another nerve. But it's never actually been proved to do that. And no one knows what happens in the synapse. You get an electrical charge that's flying along the nerve and it gets to another nerve and it flies along the next nerve. But how it jumps from one to the other, no one actually knows. So there's no science that says that you feel pain because this neurochemical is carrying it across that gap. So then that means that whatever's happening in that gap is open to influence. Mm. It's open to influence in ways we possibly can't even think about. We've got no idea about. Yeah. So if we're open to the possibility, then the pain can just reduce. And with chronic pain, I always say, take the edge off of it and it will change your life. Don't think about taking it all away. That will, that will happen in time. Take yeah. the edge off of it. And if you need to take the edge off of it with medication to start off with, do it. If you need to take the edge off of it with an altern anything alternative, do it. Try it. Find the thing that works for you, and it will change your life. Mm, man, that's powerful. I love that so much. And uh, man, this has been incredible. And I, I feel like you and I could just keep going on and on and on and on. I mean, you've got such a, a wealth of, of knowledge and your your brilliance and just the, the energy that you come with, right? It, I can tell you know, why people get such benefit, right? Having somebody so vibrant, somebody who believes in what they do and, and you know, their calling, right? You obviously have a calling and I can see that, that you're living that. And uh, that's incredible. That, that's how it feels. I do want to mention one more thing because yeah. I'm in the UK, but I am coming to the US uh, this summer in August and September, and I will be in Las Vegas and Maui and Fredericksburg in Virginia. I would love to see some of you if you come along and um, that you can check out all of the information on crystalsusa.com. Yeah, for uh, sure. And I, I would love to make the uh, the LA or the Las Vegas and then maybe even the Maui, right? Maui was a, is a very special place to me. I found a sense um, of peace I didn't realize it even existed before. And um, Maui, where, um, I'm doing a, a crystal retreat there for four days. So all of the other venues are um, workshops. There are four or five workshops in each one. Mm -hmm. But uh, Maui is the crystal retreat for four days. I'm teaching crystal healing level one and crystal healing level two. So you come out as a certified crystal healer at the end of it. And there's all sorts of other things we're doing. Um, uh, we'll be doing yoga and qigong and meditation and stuff um, over the whole four days. It will be amazing. Well, you're, you heard it here, guys. If you're watching this and this makes sense to you, um, or even if it doesn't necessarily make sense, but you feel the truth of it, you feel it resonating, right? Check him out. Reach out Reach out to Philip. Uh, make sure that you get the free gift, right? You got 48 hours to go and do that. Go and get that, but then also re reach out to him. If you have the, the opportunity to go to a retreat, I mean, uh, listen to the stories that, that Philip's been, been sharing. And if you could learn how to help yourself and then change yourself and change the world and help others with that same modality. Yeah. Reach out to Philip and find uh, how you can learn from, you know, Britain's uh, leading authority on crystals and Philip again, thank you so much for your time. I, this has been such an incredible, incredible conversation. I've really enjoyed it too. Thank you very much, Joshua, for inviting me. My pleasure. Right. My pleasure. And thank you for being a part of the, uh, you know, cancel chronic pain summit for all you watching. And this is Philip and I saying, Hey, goodbye. And may love and truth always guide your path.